that's okay. Um, well, thank you for all for joining us today and welcome. Um, we're glad that you've been able to join us. This is the second uh, webinar in WRC's new Looking Forward webinar series um, that is designed to help our communities plan for life in southeastern Vermont after the pandemic. Last fall, we hosted the first webinar in this series on community development models, and we're currently working on another webinar, hopefully for late March or early April on conservation subdivisions. Um, so if you have uh, other ideas uh, for topics of webinars or th things you'd like to have us look into, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. Um, and we hope that you take what you learned today back to your communities. Um, today's webinar will focus on tax credits and how they can be used to revitalize historic structures in our communities. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Susan Westa. I'm the Community Development Lead here at the Wyndham Regional Commission. We also have Chris Campany, our Executive Director on today, and Margot Gia, our Natural Resource Planner. Um, feel free to reach out to us uh, at any time. And if you have any questions throughout um, the webinar, we'd like to ask you to post those questions in the chat box, or you can raise your hand. If I can see you, we will um, pick, pick um, you, select you. Um, however, um, it, depending on how many people are on, uh, might be easier to enter questions into the chat box. And we will have plenty of time at the end of the webinar to answer questions. Um, please keep yourself muted uh, when you're not speaking. If your uh, connection is unstable, feel free to turn your video off, turn it back on when you want to ask a question. We are recording today's webinar, um, so you should be aware of that, and we'll post it online afterwards for those who weren't able to make it this evening. And with that, if we don't have any other questions about Zoom uh, or the meeting, uh, the webinar specifically, we I will turn it over to Chris, who's going to introduce today's speakers. Great. It's great to see everybody on this beautiful day here. Uh, early, almost feels like spring. Uh, Thanks so much to uh, Merrill and William for joining us, making time for us. Um, Merrill and I grew up across the street from each other in Abingdon, Virginia, and we both have parents from uh, Mississippi, and my mom and her mom continue to be great friends. And so I actually learned about Merrill's move to the uh, National Trust Community Investment Corporation from my mom. And then I saw she was presenting uh, uh, pre-pandemic down in Connecticut and a lot of folks from Vermont had gone to that meeting and I heard what a great presentation uh, she did and a lot of those folks said hey how can we get her to present up here and so as we started planning this looking forward webinars um, thought make, maybe during the pandemic a webinar would be a great way to get a lot of people together to hear about uh, what the NTCIC does and um, and just their advice on using these uh, tax credit mechanisms so I'll briefly introduce these folks uh, Meryl Hoopengardner, she's president of the National Trust Community Investment Corporation, a subsidiary of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, she directs fundraising and acquisition opportunities, develops and implements overall strategy and new lines of business for the company. She joined the NTCIC in 2016, bringing 19 years of experience in community development finance. That includes the structuring and closing of over $1 billion using historic new market, low income house, uh, housing tax credits. Uh, before joining NTCIC, Merrill was a principal at Advantage Capital Partners, a finance company that specializes in using public-private partnerships to raise venture capital and small business capital for investments and loans in underserved areas. Uh, she's a graduate of Duke University and chair of the Historic Tax Credit Coalition and a member of multiple boards that advise on tax credits. And Will, William Federline, did I pronounce it correct, William? Yeah, that's it. Awesome. He's an acquisitions manager with the NTCIC, where he's responsible for sourcing and underwriting historic and new markets uh, tax credit transactions across the country. Uh, since joining the organization in 2016, he's been responsible for closing of over $120 million in equity investments and tax credit transactions on behalf of several major U.S. financial institutions, totaling over $750 million in development costs. Sample transactions range from a small business incubator in Buffalo, New York, 
to a nationally recognized pediatric health and research center in Washington, D.C. Prior to joining uh, NTCIC, William worked for a boutique uh, tax credit syndication and consulting firm. He's a graduate of University of South Carolina, which is a nemesis of my Mississippi State University women bulldogs. So um, that's that. Uh, Merrill, I'll turn it over to you and William, and thanks again so much. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Well, I'll get us started real quick, and then I'm going to tag in William, and I'm actually going to sneak away for a bit, and then I'm going to come back for the Q&A. Um, as Chris mentioned, we uh, had the privilege of growing up in central Appalachia, literally on Main Street of our small town, which is part of where I got my passion for economic development related things, particularly growing up in a historic district and thinking about the intersection of historic preservation as a community development tool. Um, I apparently have missed the family memo that one goes from Mississippi to Virginia to Vermont because I've been stuck in Northern Virginia and haven't made it any farther north. So I will take that under advisement because I'd rather have your snow than our freezing rain. Um, so just real quick on NTCIC's approach to tax credit investing, as Chris mentioned, we're the tax credit investment arm of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the national nonprofit um, historic preservation organization that was originally chartered by Congress over 50 years ago. So we describe ourselves as a tax credit syndicator. That means we raise money from institutional investors, primarily banks and insurance companies who have tax liability and want to be investing in community development projects. So we help them invest their money in historic revitalization projects, particularly those in low income census tracts, which we use the new markets tax credit as an additional piece of subsidy for. And we also finance solar energy development um, with our other subsidiary NT Solar. So we've done about $1.6 billion of tax credit investing in our 20 year history. Um, and as William will talk to you about, the centerpiece for that is how to use the federal historic tax credit, which continues to be the federal government's biggest investment in historic preservation. Um, in my role as putting on my hat as the chair of the Historic Tax Credit Coalition, I will also give you all a preview that we are um, within a couple of weeks of introducing another bill in Congress this year that would make changes to the historic tax credit, which would bring more value to the credit, especially for small projects, um, and would make it easier to use for projects that have nonprofit sponsors. So if anybody is interested in being more involved in our advocacy efforts, I definitely encourage you to reach out to me um, offline and we can plug you in with our public policy manager. So with that, I'm gonna tag in William, who's gonna do some HTC 101 things, and we appreciate you joining us today. Hi, Linda. Awesome, thank you, Meryl. Appreciate the introduction, and thank you to everyone here that's uh, joined the webinar to learn a little bit more about the historic tax credit, uh, a little bit about new markets tax credits, and uh, how all these programs fit together. So let me share my screen real quick and pull these slides up. All right, uh, are you seeing the slides there? All good, perfect, okay, great. All right, well, let's get started. So we have the Perspectives in Historic Rehab, Funding and Accessing Historic and New Markets Tax Credit. Chris already did a great job of giving the bio, so I'm gonna go ahead and skip this. So what are tax credits? How do you get them? How do you use them? So it's important to remember that a tax credit is different from a tax deduction. So while a tax deduction reduces your income subject to tax, the tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction in the tax that you have to pay. Now at the federal level, tax credits are designed to encourage certain types of investment and development that are considered overall beneficial to the economy, the environment, or to further any other purpose that the government deems important. So you have low income housing tax credits, historic tax credits, new markets tax credits, solar energy tax credits, you know, all different types of programs, there's tax credits for them. And what they do, as I mentioned, is they reduce the amount of income tax dollar for dollar that individuals or companies owe to the government. Now, investors with large tax liability, there's a market for them to buy these credits to lower their own tax bills. So think large banks, insurance companies, groups with significant tax appetite that, you know, are able to effectively mitigate their tax bill through participating in investment of these programs. At the same time, historic restoration projects, 
are prohibitively expensive and they need inexpensive capital in order to help pay for project costs. And the role that a tax credit syndicator plays, Merrill did a good job of explaining it, we basically pay matchmaker between projects that are going to qualify for the tax credits and investors that have the tax appetite that uh, are able to efficiently utilize the credit. And in exchange for taking the credit, they'll pay you know, a, a price per dollar credit below $1 in order to monetize the credits. So it's important to remember that not all credits are created equal. So the Federal Historic Tax Credit, it, it encourages the redevelopment of historic buildings, of course. It's been around since the 70s. There's 35 companion state credit programs. At the design level, the tax credit is administered by the National Park Service. So the Technical Preservation Services, a division of MPS, does review of the tax credit applications that get submitted. We'll get into that application process in a little bit. But the credit itself is earned by the developer uh, for incurring qualified rehabilitation expenses essentially the hard and soft costs that you're gonna incur in, in connection with rehabbing a historic building. And it's a 20% credit taken over a single or five year period, the five year compliance or recapture period once the project is placed into service. We'll get into what all that means in a little bit. And then you have the federal new markets tax credit. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this today, but I did wanna bring it up a little bit. It encourages investment in low income communities. It's been around since the early 2000s. Some states also have their own state and market tax credit program. It's administered by the CDFI Fund, which is a division of the Treasury Department. The credits are only awarded to community development entities, or CDEs, of which NTCIC is considered a CDE. And this one's a 39% credit taken over a seven-year compliance period and recapture period. Now, the most important difference between federal historics and federal new markets is the way that they're earned or generated. So federal historics, it's important to remember, are by right, meaning that if you take the steps, jump through the hoops, you get your rehab qualified by the Park Service and ultimately finish the project, you're going to generate the tax credits. Federal New Markets is different. Federal New Markets, the credits get allocated to CDEs and projects that are searching for new markets have to work through the CDEs to get access to these credits. So CDEs have authority to allocate new markets tax credits to a given project. So it's competitive, it's not by right. I mean, and oftentimes demand for the credits far outseed supply of available credits. So that's the key difference between the two. Now, historic tax credits 101. What are they and how do you get them and what can they do? So a little bit of history on the historic program. The National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 authorized the National Register of Historic Places. So the National Register coordinates and supports public and private efforts to identify, evaluate, and protect America's historic structures and resources. And in order for a building to be eligible for the tax credits, the historic tax credits, they have to be either individually listed on the National Register of Historic Places or a contributing building to a National Register of Historic District. Now the tax credit itself, as I mentioned before, was enacted in the mid seventies to preserve and rehabilitate significant properties became a permanent part of the tax code during tax reform in 1986. And most recently, the historic tax credit was saved from being eliminated from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in the end of 2017. So post 2017, the tax bill, there's a couple types of HTCs. You have a federal historic, it's a 20% credit for the certified historic structure which is again, buildings listed on the National Register. So a certified historic structure means that it's a building listed on the National Register of Historic Places, or it's a building that contributes to a National Register of Historic District. And then there are state historic credits, as I mentioned, there's available in 35 states that can be paired up with the historic tax credit at the federal level. So it's, you can double dip. It's not like I can only do the state, I can't do the federal. Now certain states, I don't believe Vermont has a statewide historic tax credit. I think they have another credit, but it's a little bit different. And they do have, but some states, so I live in Virginia, has a very popular state historic program. Louisiana has a very busy one, Missouri, other states. Ultimately, it's more subsidy for these historic rehab projects to move forward. Now, I mentioned before, the historic tax credit is administered by the National Park Service, who handles the design review, and then the, the local SHPO, so the State Historic Preservation Offices, will review the design first before it goes to the Park Service. And then tax aspects of the program are administered by the IRS. So they're the ones that set the rules for how these pro, uh, tax credits uh, are monetized and kind of the structure behind it. 
So how do historic tax credits work? I mentioned this before that the tax credit is by right, but to generate historic tax credits, property owners or developers must undertake the substantial rehabilitation of a certified historic structure with an eligible end use. So those words are bolded for a reason and we'll explain what they mean. So am I eligible? Building must be a certified historic structure. So you have to be individually listed on the National Register or a contributing building in a National Register Historic District. And it must be a certified rehabilitation, which means that your renovation adheres to the Secretary of the Interior's uh, standards for historic rehab. So essentially, your rehab has to respect the historic integrity of the building. And it has to be income producing. So at the federal level, to qualify for the credit, it has to be either apartment, hotel, office, retail, theater, things that generate income. Owner-occupied residences, like your house, does not qualify for the federal historic tax credit. And it must be a substantial rehabilitation, meaning that you must spend in excess of $5,000 or the adjusted basis of the building. Now, the substantial rehab test was put in place to prevent, say you renovated like two floors of the Empire State Building or something like that. They don't, they, the government doesn't want you to claim credits on that. They want you to undertake you know, a derelict building and rehab it and undertake like a larger project. And the adjusted basis calculation is, just means that your purchase price, what you paid for the building, less any cost attributable to land, less any depreciation you've taken, plus any improvements you've made. So basically, you have, most of the time when we undertake these projects as an investor, the purchase price of the building is well below what the developer ends up spending on the building just because they're in such poor condition. So we don't really run into the, any issues with this too frequently, but it's important to recall if you're going to undertake a smaller project, perhaps uh, in your own community, it's important to remember um, how that works. So to qualify for certification, developers must complete a three-part application that is approved by the state SHPO and then goes on to the National Park Service. So part one, it confirms that the building is actually historic. So that's confirming that it's is an either National Register listed or a contributing building to a historic district. Part two talks about your plans for the renovation, meaning here's how my renovation is going to meet the historic standards. And then part three is basically you, you did what you said you were going to do in your part two. So you take a bunch of pictures, submit them in. I'm, I'm making that process sound very simple. I don't think it's that simple, but you do have preservation consultants that go out and, and that's all they do is their, their jobs that we work with in this industry um, well, it's not all they do, but they're very good at what they do. And they help facilitate this application process on behalf of uh, these historic rehab projects. And typically, uh, so you would get your part three once you're done with the project. And then this is when the credits have been certified by the government. And as I mentioned before, the tax credits are 20% of QRE or qualified rehabilitation expenditures. So what is QRE? These are the tax credit eligible costs on, in which the HTC is calculated. So what costs, or sorry, what costs, what counts? Hard costs, construction, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, uh, certain soft costs count, construction period interest, insurance, real estate taxes, architectural fees. Uh, generally, all the costs that you're going to attribute to a capital account and depreciate are going to qualify, except you can't count acquisition costs in your basis, um, demolition costs, leasing expenses, any new construction uh, adjacent to the building, or any uh, non-contributing additions on the building that are not part of the historic structure. Costs like that will not count. And if the project is eligible, the building owner is then able to attract capital from investors in exchange for these tax credits. So the value of the credits, as I mentioned before, it's a 20% tax credit. Investors will typically pay less than a dollar per credit to realize the benefit. So the pricing on historic credits can vary. I don't want to say it varies wildly, but there's definitely a more established market, bigger projects compared to smaller ones. So I say bigger. If you're spending in excess of 10 million bucks on a project, or if you're spending, so our firm, Kind of our sweet spot is projects that spend around 25 million in total development costs. So they're generating a $5 million credit, 20%. Generally, these credits are priced in the low to mid 80s for a credit that has to be taken over five years. There's typically an expectation that we get some type of cash return during the compliance period of around 2% on our money per year. And at the end of the compliance period, the investor 
for us if we have a put option to force the investor or developer to buy us out. And then this whole, I'll get into this in a little bit, but then the structure that's put in place to monetize the credits can then be collapsed. On smaller deals, typically, uh, since you have to take the credit over five years, you're going to see pricing in the low 80s or pr typically high 70s. Um, it, but this really depends. Now, if you're undertaking a project and you have a great relationship with the local bank or something that's also providing the construction loan and they have the ability to take the credits, they might be willing to pay you above market pricing just because they're not as far down. You know, when we look at these projects, we're kind of looking at them in isolation of, you know, well, I could do this at this price or this at this price. Where is that? as much emotional attachment as there may be, or we're not trying to, you know, provide some, uh, you know, a sweetheart deal per se, because it, it's not really how we're incentivized and it's not really how the, the market works at the higher, kind of at these higher price development costs, higher project budgets. It's just not how the process works. So you certainly can get better pricing on smaller deals. This is just kind of where the market is right now. And again, credits times investor pricing is HDC equity. Now, I, I'm talking about pricing, I'm talking about equity. It's important to remember, and I have not mentioned this yet, that federal tax credits, they cannot be bought and sold at the federal level. So some states, I'll get a certificate that says, I, William, generated this tax credit. And I, have, and I can say, hey, Chris, I'm gonna sell you this tax credit for 95 cents on the dollar, shake hands, and that's it. And that's all the process. So at the federal level, you can't do that. You can't just plain buy and sell credits, but you can allocate them to a partner in a partnership. So there's structures that you put in place in concert with attorneys, accountants, to make the monetization of the credits work. I'm not going to lie, it is a little complex. I'm going to explain it on this next slide and how this process works. So it's unfortunately, it's not as straightforward as a sophisticated credit. But again, it can be as complex or as, you know, as simple as you want it to be. So here's a little bit of kind of the basic structure of how these projects work. So if you look here on the left side of the screen, you have the master landlord, the developer. This is the entity that's going to undertake the project and rehab it. So if you see the historic building, this is the developer partnership that owns the building via that managing member entity right below it. They're the ones that's going to borrow the money um, for the construction loan to pay for costs. So I'm assuming in a typical situation, there's gonna be some combination of debt and equity. So they're gonna have a construction loan, and then the rest is gonna be from either their own pockets out of equity or historic equity or other sources. So this developer partner is the one that undertakes the renovation, incurs the qualified rehab expenses and generates the credits. Now this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but on the federal program, under the Internal Revenue Code, you're allowed to pass through credits from the landlord to the master tenant, whereby this federal HDC investor in blue, this is us or NTCIC, would then take this 99% ownership interest in this tenant entity that is going to manage the building, collect the rents from the tenants, pay the operating expenses, and in exchange for our ownership interest, and because that lease is in place between landlord and tenant, that allows the developers allowed to pass through the credits to tenant, which get allocated to the HTC investor as the owner. And in exchange for their ability to claim the credits, they contribute equity to the project. So I guess, is there any questions in the chat? I'm not sure if anything, if maybe this is a good stop point. If anyone had any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer them. Nothing in the chat yet. Okay, cool. All right, we'll keep rolling. All right, so a compliance period. I mentioned that there's a five-year compliance period on the historic credit, meaning that for the five years post-completion, uh, uh, which is when the credits are generated at completion, you can't make material alterations to the building. You can't sell your stake in the building. And a total loss, like if the building caught fire, would also result in a recapture of the credits. So the credit is earned 4% per year over five years. As I mentioned, it's a 20% credit taken over five years. But the way the investor contributes their equity into these deals, so think of, for example, NTCIC. Typically, you know, we don't put at closing or when the project has lines up its construction financing and other sources of so grants of their, or I've identified their own money that's been put into this project. We'll typically put in 30% of our money then we'll hold back another 45% until the project's done. Once the project gets their part three approval, 
we'll put in maybe 10 or 15 percent, meaning that so at that point we've got our credits. And then we'll usually hold some money back for stabilization or once the project begins to generate income, to pay us that cash portion of our return that's necessary. And then historic tax credits and nonprofits. I did want to mention a few items on this uh, about nonprofits because people think that uh, non, since they're a nonprofit that you can't generate historic credits because you don't pay any income tax. That's somewhat true, but there's a way to structure around it so that you can use uh, historic credits to help pay for projects. So think of like Friends of the Local Theater or something like that, 501c3. They're able to generate these credits. It's just a structuring, uh, structuring issue. So a little bit of the basics of tax-exempt use property. In general, historic credits are available to taxpayers that are liable for federal income tax. Think individuals, businesses, and 501c3 organizations are exempt from federal income tax. And they can't directly benefit. And then also if you have 501c3 tenants in the building, that can also jeopardize the historic tax credit. Now tax exempts include federal and state local governments, um, charities, foreign persons, entities, tribal governments, things of that nature. But can they still use HTCs? Yes, they can. It just requires careful structure and considerations. So what is tax exempt use property? And now this is kind of getting really in the weeds here. So don't worry about trying to remember any of this stuff. The important takeaway is that if you are a nonprofit and you're undertaking historic rehab, there is a way to do it. You just need to consult with an, your attorney and accountants to make sure that you're undertaking it properly and make sure they're experienced in this field. So property is treated as tax exempt use if either more than 50% of the property is leased to a tax exempt or a tax exempt entity is a partner in the partnership that owns the property. And any expenditure that you spend that's allocated to tax exempt use property wouldn't generate historic tax credits. Now, the disqualified lease rules mean that for any non-residential rental property that gets leased to a tax exempt, so we talked a little bit about that lease between the developer partnership and the master tenant before. If any part of that was financed with tax exempt, I guess I could read all these. I'm not going to because it's, it's getting a little bit in the weeds here for this uh, presentation. But essentially, it, there's ways. So that there's if you have a disqualified lease, then you don't have tax credits. But as long as you structure around these rules, then you can generate tax credits. That's the key takeaway. So for example, here's a better example. Now, tax exempt pro use property, uh, then art gallery, restaurant, and event space. So a nonprofit bought a building for rehab and operating of a restaurant, event space, and an art gallery. And they just set up a special purpose entity, owner LLC, to buy the building. Now the art gallery portion of the property was leased back to the nonprofit. However, it was less than 50% of the space. Therefore, that's not tax exempt use and you're okay on the credits. And then the managing member of the building and that developer partnership was a wholly owned for-profit subsidiary and they were able to file an election that allowed them to be classified to tax as a corporation, thereby avoiding the tax exempt use rules. Basically meaning that, again, I don't wanna keep repeating myself, but there is a way to do it if you're working, if you're familiar with like a local theater or something of that nature that's trying to raise money to rehab their building and they're a nonprofit, just don't immediately discount the ability to use historic tax credits because there is a way to do it. Now, new markets tax credits 101, now these are, what are they? How do they work? So the new markets tax credit is completely different from historics. While we, NTCIC, only deploy our new markets into historic rehabilitation projects, that's not necessarily the case for other CDs. You don't have to deploy them into historic buildings. So the new markets credit encourages investment in low-income communities that traditionally have had poor access to debt and equity capital. Now, the CDFI fund, that division of the Treasury Department, only awards tax credit allocation to qualified CDEs. So NTCIC is a qualified CDE, and we specialize in providing allocation to historic projects that have some type of tangible community benefit, job story, um, things of that nature. Anything that positively impacts low-income persons and low-income communities, we're, we're willing to take a look at. Now, the credit is equal to 39% of the qualified equity investment made by a new markets investor into a CDE. So before, on the historic side, the credit was 20% of eligible costs. In new markets, it's related to the qualified equity investment or QBI made by a new markets investor. Now, CDEs target projects that benefit low income communities known as qualified active low income community businesses, qualities, to provide allocation. 
And now new markets investors also pay low 80s per dollar of credit. Now, how do we evaluate projects? It's census tract driven. So the projects have to be located in a new market tax credit eligible census tract, meaning that they must have a poverty rate greater than 20% of area median income or uh, less than, or, or households earn less than 80% of area median income. And then there's also census tracts that are considered severely distressed. That means their poverty rate is greater than 30% and they have area, households earn less than 60% of area median income or they have an unemployment rate one and a half times the national average. And you can look up, there's several websites if you look up new market tax credit mapping tool that will allow you to type in an address and you can see if you're eligible, uh, if you're in an el your project is an eligible census tract. I want to talk a little bit about this community benefits. So how do community benefits factor in the tax credit availability? So we, all of our new markets projects have to have a good story. So for example, a couple of years ago, we did a uh, workforce development training center in Buffalo that was in an old historic building, kind of basically taking an empty building and retraining people to work in advanced manufacturing concepts within an old manufacturing complex. Like that's an example of something we did. We did a, um, a healthcare research facility in DC uh, that was mentioned before that used to be a hospital that was being turned back into a healthcare related use. And then we've also done um, some projects that are like small business incubators with, for uh, food type businesses. So we did a project a couple years ago where it was a, a food incubator. So think like somebody that wants to that's good at baking cupcakes, something like that. And they want to do cupcakes for a wedding, but they're, you know, they can't do 500 cupcakes in their, uh, in their kitchen. So they need more space, but they're not quite ready for brick and mortar. Like projects like that are the types of projects that we try to target for small business development and the types of projects that are uh, qualified for the new market tax credit or they're attractive to us from a new market's perspective. Now, the overall impacts of a given project are very important. You know, obviously, we'd like to see jobs, good quantity of jobs, or just accessible jobs to people that don't have bachelor's degrees, uh, patients served, if it's a medical facility, what are the community impacts or what, and the input? Like, what is, is this something that the community is asking for? And how many participants is this going to impact? So, for example, we're looking at a charter school right now in Philadelphia in a low income neighborhood. And we're trying to figure out how many students that one's a little bit easier to track or get are positively impacted by this project. And then obviously we collect reporting requirements on this to uh, verify and track against what we projected at when we initially decided to work with the project in the first place. So, and this is kind of getting a little bit of the weeds a bit about how the actual new market dollars make their way to the projects, but they usually, it's, um, it's an equity investment that's disguised as, or I guess it's a debt investment that's disguised as equity. So there's typically money that gets lent, and I'll explain it in the next slide. Um, that, so basically this says Quiliki A reflects the leverage loan. This would be your kind of traditional financing that the project has been able to line up. And then the tax credit equity, uh, the new market equity comes in the form of a loan to the projects. And these loans have below market interest rates and flexible financing features with uh, interest rates generally in like the one to 2% range. But I think the most important thing to remember is that as a rule of thumb, projects can expect to net roughly 18 to 20% of the total new markets allocation that they can secure in dollars that they ultimately do not have to pay back. So here's a little bit of kind of the structure. I know there's been a lot of charts today, so I apologize for all the charts. The, so you have at the bottom here, your building your quality, this is your project. And you have NTCIC, for example, as a CDE. This, in this instance, the QEI is 10 million. So that means that the project costs are at least 10 million. It's a 39% credit. So you're generating 3.9 million in credits. The tax credit investor up here is paying, let's say 80 cents in a dollar. So they're putting in $3.2 million. Now you have to get to that whole 10 million though to be able to recognize the, the new market's credit of 3.9. So then you have your traditional bank loan coming in. So instead of a project loan being lent directly to the project or the borrower, in this instance, they're, think of this project investment fund piggy bank like a funnel. The dollars are being contributed to this investment fund who then, can, when you combine that those loan proceeds with the tax credit equity, 
It essentially buys down the, the cost of the debt capital. It makes it a little bit cheaper and easier for the project to borrow this money. And then this, at the end of the seven year period, this Quiliki B, that $3.2 million, that balance in the loan is forgiven. So the project can keep that subsidy, or that subsidy is kept in the project. So there's a seven year compliance period on new markets, which you know, in the historics it was five. Stricter on the compliance side, uh, risk of recapture for the full tax credit amount is simply guaranteed. But recapture in the new markets world is very rare. Uh, not, we've never had any issue like that in our portfolio. I'm struggling to think of any other industry situation that have seen a recapture on the new market side. Essentially, it's, you know, you continue, you, at the beginning of the seven year period, as long as you keep your business within that census tract at, at a very basic level and operate as you said you would, there shouldn't be any issues for uh, new markets compliance. And then, as I mentioned, what does the quality be or the project received from the new markets investment? They get those below market interest rates for seven years, flexible financing terms. They ultimately get to keep that equity. Now we do have a uh, small deal fund I do want to mention. It's, um, it offers low cost tax credit financing to historic properties in designated Main Street areas where we provide up to 4 million of our new markets allocation project. And we also help monetize the federal historic tax credit. Now they have to be in severely distressed census tracts. Project sizes generally between four and 8 million really will go above that, go to say maybe 10, 12 million. They have to have all their other sources lined up. We like to have the tax credit applications on the historic side approved um, and in place if they're not already. Uh, architectural drawings prepared, GC identified. They have to still have some type of community benefit story to them. So the impact, support from the local community, um, some type of good story there for a reason why we would want to participate. Wait, and then the his yeah, go ahead. Quick question. So when you say properties in Main Street communities, do you mean like actual members of Main Street America or are using that term more generically? So I'm using it more generically, but this slide does have that Main Street America in there. We did, when, when we originally sought out to do this Main Street fund a few years ago, the thinking was to try and do it in Main Street community designated ones, but it just proved to be too difficult. So now we really just look at it in any type of community, you know, any small town, we really uh, take a look at. The, uh, you know, as you can imagine, though, it, it's kind of tricky to place, you know, that something that's in a really distressed census tract and is historic and is in a town and it's like spending enough. It can be tricky. I'm not going to lie. Um, the historics are enhanced with the new markets, essentially meaning that the historic dollars are the price per historic credit is essentially higher. If you think about it on a just historic basis, because we're using some of those new markets dollars to help uh, increase the benefit that the project receives. And there's capped legal fees and things of that nature. And we'll invest in both credits. But it's, um, you know, to the extent that you have something that you think could be a fit, feel free to shoot me an email or anything after this presentation. Be happy to uh, follow up with question. you on what that could work. Uh, sure. Yeah. What is the definition of a small community? Is um, there a I, population? No, no, there's no strict definition. Right? Okay. Just Thank not really you. any type of community. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And I think that's about it. So uh, I appreciate everyone taking the time to join. I'm happy to answer any questions. Now, we covered a lot of material there in a short amount of time. So I'm sure there are some questions out there. Feel free to chime in with any that you have, and uh, we're happy to answer them for you. If any folks have questions, please feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat box. Mute. Um, <laughs> I'll put them in the chat. It's okay, Gail. Go ahead. Actually, yeah, go I, ahead. It's a little complicated. So um, I wish we did qualify for those new um, that new grant program or the new kind of project program, but we definitely fall into this last one in terms of London Dairy. And if we even reach four million, well, I guess we could get to four million <laughs> on a couple of projects. Um, so it sounds like, I mean, then we should get a group of private investors, it sounds like, correct? Or do so, all those principles you talked about with the nonprofit also apply there? It's a good question. So I, I would answer it this way. If you're working on a smaller project, 
oftentimes, now I talked about a lot about monetizing with a third party. If the, if the individuals undertaking the rehabilitation have the ability to use the credits themselves, because they can be allocated to individuals, that's another option. It can be attractive, but at the same time, the every individual's tax situation is very unique and the historic tax credit can only offset certain types of income that you get. So like, for example, it doesn't offset W-2 wage income that you typically see as a taxpayer. So there's all sorts of rules around it and somebody should definitely consider, if they're thinking of doing that or undertaking a CERC rehab project, should definitely talk to their personal accountant to see if it allows them to efficiently utilize the credits. Now on a federal level, you can carry them back one year and you can also you can carry them forward 15 or 20 years. So, and so, so if you can't use it all in one year, it's an option for you for a smaller deal. This is Meryl, I'll add, we're also seeing that some people are trying to combine projects. So William worked on a project in um, Cincinnati a couple of years ago where multiple buildings that weren't adjacent were being developed as part of a neighborhood revitalization plan. So there's one common developer that tied it together, but they were trying to get to some sort of scale. So the complexity of undertaking a tax credit transaction and needing to have legal and tax professionals involved didn't erode all the benefit of mm -hmm. <laughs> actually getting, getting the subsidy. Um, and then we also see that there's a great opportunity to get local financing providers involved. So, you know, a, a local community bank may be much more interested in credits that are say under a million in credits that are gonna be generated now that the historic tax credit is earned over a five year period, even a project, a $5 million historic tax credit project, 5 million in total development cost is only generating a million in credits and you're gonna deliver them $200,000 a year for five years. An institutional investor may not want that, um, right. you know, at the scale of some of the partners we have like mm -hmm. a Citibank, but a community bank may want that, especially if they're the lender. So we've found that that's one of the ways of getting more tax credit investors involved is when they have another stake in the outcome of the project. Um, and then as William mentioned, individuals can also participate. It's just a little tricky for a tax planning perspective. Um, real estate developers often have some trouble with it because they're already getting depreciation losses from the ownership of their buildings. So they may not actually be taxpayers because they have enough losses that are flowing through their tax returns. So it's when people want to like partner up with their neighbors who are doctors and lawyers, um, not the ones who are doing real estate to do local co-developing on projects. And that's an option too. Um, just one more piece of that. So we are eligible for village tax credits. So how do these kind of work together or not, or do they conflict? Is that the state program in Vermont that I had kind of briefly touched on before? So I admittedly am not an expert on those. Meryl, are you familiar with those? It, not specifically, though what we find is that the historic tax credit at the federal level is usually like the chassis that comes off the assembly line, the Toyota line, and then you can turn it into a Corolla or you can turn it into a Lexus, depending on what other incentives you wanna layer onto it. So. Typically, it does work well with other incentives because it, the credits are being allocated at the federal level to the owners of the partnership that owns the building, or you have the option to do the more complicated tax structure. But in the more complicated tax structure, it's even easier to separate out who's getting the federal credits and who's getting other incentives. And that particularly makes the federal credit play better with state and local incentives. Okay. Thank you. I see that we have Jake Hemmerich on, yes. not to call him out, but I'm wondering if he would like to say something about the uh, state tax credit program. Are you there, Jake? <laughs> yes, yeah, Sue, I am here. And I, I, you know, I was actually, you may have heard me talking. I wasn't muted. I was at, reacting to a staff report I'm writing, and so I have this on in the background. And, and I, I haven't been following closely, so I'm not, I'm not prepared to uh, be put on the spot right now with that. And I apologize for the background noise. Yeah, they were just asking about uh, historic, or, you know, the state tax credits here in Vermont. How they've, how they've layered on with new market tax credits and federal historic tax credits. 
But don't worry, you're not on the spot. <laughs> Only if you have something to say. Yeah, That's I have nothing to add at this time. But. Thank you. But if anybody has more specific questions about that, we can certainly connect you with other folks at the state who can help you with that. And we've had, I put in the chat, um, a number of these, especially projects using new market tax credits uh, and also historic tax credits. Uh, a couple of ones that probably people are most familiar with are, uh, would be Commonwealth Dairy and Brooks House. Um, but, um, and then we were, we've been involved, we get involved with these sometimes because a lot of these projects are also Brownfields projects and we have a revolving loan fund. And so that we're not involved in, Newmark, in, in, the, uh, in the pulling together of all the deals, sometimes we'll have um, a role to play in the project. And, and I think, Sue, correct me if I'm wrong, but the big panel block project in Bennington is making use Putnam. of a whole, what's that? The Putnam block. The put, what did I say? Powell. Pa sorry, we we <laughs> we also are involved in a Brownfield project in Powell too. So the Putnam, but yes, the Putnam block uh, in Bennington made use of just a raft of these things, and that's just kind of the nature of development in Vermont right now. Is these you know, these broad public-private partnerships making use of these things? So um, so they're 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 not they're they're not uncommon. Hopefully, we'll see you know maybe post-pandemic, even more investment in the region, seeing people make more use of these tools. Mm -hmm. And I see that Jake just posted a link to the state um, tax credit program. So if anyone wants to take a look at that in the chat box. Yes, do you have a question? Go ahead. I do. Uh, this is too complicated for me to type out and I'm a lousy typist, so I'm just gonna ask it. Um, I live in a little town called Wyndham we have a historic meeting house. It was built around 1809. It used to be half owned by a church and half owned by the town. It's now completely owned by the town. Um, we use it for town meeting when there's not a pandemic. We have the town library in it, but most of the time the building sits, um, you know, pretty much unoccupied and unused. There's a committee that's interested in updating it, bringing out the fire code, doing some weatherization, landscaping, and so on hoping to rent it for whatever, wedding receptions, family reunions, community parties, or whatever. Uh, this is not gonna be a $10 million project. So I'm assuming that the situation you're describing probably isn't uh, relevant to us. Do you have any advice? Is there any, anything we can do to try to get historic tax credits if we don't have a project that's that expensive and won't generate constant revenue, but might generate sporadic revenue. My first piece of advice would be to look really carefully at whether the candle's worth the wick. If you're trying to pursue tax credits on a small project, generally speaking, uh, particularly if it's owned by a nonprofit or a government agency, you have to jump through even more hoops to make it work with the way the tax code is currently written, although, as I mentioned at the outset, we're trying to get that part of the federal law changed. Um, but you would likely need to partner with a private developer to even be eligible for the credits because of the ownership of it. And so you'd be, you know, having a public-private partnership, which is definitely viable, but that partner's certainly going to want to make sure that whatever your business plan is, is going to be worth the cost of rehab, especially since the tax credit's only gonna cover 20% of the qualified cost. So you're gonna have to finance the rest of that with something else, which is either you know, a capital campaign you're doing or you know, a local lender or things like that. So at the end of the day, you just have to make sure that your equation's gonna balance between the cost of rehab and whether you can make that up through operations over time. We often find that for small nonprofit and government owned properties that are gonna have, that have fixer upper needs and are gonna have intermittent use, they can get more benefit through facade grant programs and other grant incentives um, that are offered, you know, either through the state or through a local organization than trying to pursue federal tax credits. Um, but it's, 
not to say it's not possible, but I would say look at what all of the options are when you consider whether it's it's going to be worth the the trouble. We we have financed several slightly larger event places over time, and I will say they're some of the most challenging projects in our portfolio because of the intermittent use. Um, I mean, obviously everything's shut down right now, so those deals are all on our asset management watch list. But they're they're challenging projects if you're if you're if it's a new business for the property, um, trying to figure out what the real market needs are. So you have to do the same kind of local market study analysis like you would do if you were going to build a new building from scratch and operate, you know, local events and um, receptions and that sort of thing in it. It, it's yeah. just it's just more complicated to add historic to it. It's not less <laughs> because yeah, you're getting twenty percent credit. It's tricky. I will say we did a similar project at my old job actually here in Virginia for a local community center, and it was decided that because of the prior use rules, where I was talking about where they had nonprofit ownership before, and then there was nonprofit ownership post renovation, it didn't qualify the federal credits in the first place. But in Virginia, their state tax credit program doesn't have that similar restriction. So it allowed them to at least obtain some benefit from the pursuit of the credits, but that was a very unique one-off situation. And like Meryl said, the juice probably just isn't worth the squeeze on something like that, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, well. Wow. I think that was a lot for everyone to take in. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate everyone sitting in and uh, listening to me for the last hour. I appreciate it. Hopefully somebody, uh, hopefully somebody learned something useful today. Absolutely. Oh, wait. Okay. Yeah. Um, I thought maybe another question was coming in, but no. Um, yeah, I think it's, good to get people, you know, an introduction to all this, even if they don't completely understand it all. Um, they are at least somewhat familiar with it. And when they're looking at these projects, they, you know, reach out to other folks or organizations like yours to help them through the process. Absolutely. Yeah. If you think you might have something, don't hesitate to reach out. Go to our website. Our contact information is on there. Well, thank you very much. I really did learn a lot. So as I was doing other things. <laughs> but it's great. Good, you don't know, have a recording. No, I appreciate this very much. Thank you. It is very helpful. I think I'll be curious to see. We've had um, a surge of interest in Vermont because I guess in part how the we've managed the pandemic as a state and uh, um, you had a lot of residential purchases. It looks like they've you know, just in the grapevine, it sounds like there've been some commercial purchases as well. So we'll see if that level of investment continues because if some of the people who've moved here continue to make this their permanent residence, you know, what tends to happen is they'll invite their friends or other family up. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that's happening, I notice in, in a number of our communities is we're seeing this intergenerational transfer of properties as the boomers are aging out and retiring and other people are coming in. So hopefully, you know, some of the people who are able to drop $300,000, $400,000, $500,000 on a house they've never even seen and then come up to Vermont, Maybe they'll be willing to do that in other properties as well. So hopefully that will. Oh, we work. hope. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle has a question. Yeah. It, well, is there still time? I don't want to keep people yeah. past. So I, uh, I fall into the category that Chris was just talking about. My husband and I uh, sold our business and our home in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and bought a place in Chester, Vermont. And we're here full time. Um, we have another property that we want to sell and uh, we want to do a 1031 exchange. Uh, so that means buying a commercial property. And what I would like to do is figure out some way to, uh, you know, roll that nest egg for us a little bit for some income. But uh, largely I'd, what I'd like to do is either find a minority community or, or women with children who need an employment opportunity. And um, there's a, a number of historic buildings in Chester or Ludlow or Springfield um, that we could buy and um, set up 
a restaurant, we would probably take our concept from Portsmouth and put it here because it's the kind of concept that is sort of franchisable. You don't have to be a chef uh, with hands on every plate. It, it can be uh, duplicated by people who are not necessarily chefs. Um, and it was very successful. And I think that if we got women with children um, and created a team so that childcare could be built in with them, perhaps even on the premises, because some of these buildings would have living or rate quarters as well as um, kitchen and restaurant space. And I know that restaurants are not, um, they're struggling right now. Uh, the one that we sold is still going gangbusters even through the pandemic. Um, and I think that if you could set it up to be sort of pandemic proof um, with takeout to go and that type of food, I think you could be successful. Um, so the, I was familiar with the tax credits somewhat because we had a project we were contemplating doing in Belfast, um, which is an opportunity zone too. Um, but anyway, that my, that's sort of my idea. I'm not sure if the historic tax credits uh, particularly work, um, but I, the, I was interested more in the historic preservation, economic development. And so if anybody has any um, great ideas around that, feel free to send them my way. Sounds like I don't have any specific ideas, but I will add that We've done projects that have historic tax credit and opportunity zone investments in the same project. We've done them in several different states now. Um, and it's definitely, I think, where we've seen it work the best has been where the purchaser of the building is putting in their own equity that they uh -huh. have from selling other business. So particularly in the generational wealth transfer, like you mentioned, it's a good way. It, instead of it doing a 1031, you could do an opportunity zone investment and delay paying capital gains. Um, and you can put historic and or new markets um, or low income housing credits, depending on how much housing you're going to have all in those different pieces of the puzzle. So maybe I should look more into oppor opportunity zone credits. Opportunity zones don't give you any credit, but it does keep you from having, it defers your need to pay capital gains taxes um, until 2026, and then you get, you never have to pay tax on any future gain. So okay. if you invested $100 now from the sale of your business you recently had, you would wait until 2026 to pay tax on it. Mm -hmm. And then if you later sold the new thing, you invested in it for 200 you never pay tax on that additional hundred dollars in gain. Okay. And I'll admit I've, I've lost track of uh, where where the Opportunity Zone portfolios stand locally, but I'm pretty sure Rockingham pulled one together. Um, so do you remember, did, did Brattleboro pull one together? Yes, I believe so. Because so, they're, they're, and then also, um, so those are in the Wyndham region. I think there are two Opportunity Zones in Brattleboro, if I'm remembering correctly, and one in Rockingham and Bellows Falls. And then but up in, uh, I, I would imagine that Springfield. Um, it is. Yeah. I wanted to. I wanted Chester just because it's uh, close by, but that's probably, yeah, I don't think it's in the opportunity zone. I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. Opportunity zones are only twenty-five percent of low-income communities in each state, so it's essentially a quarter of all new markets eligible census tracts are opportunity zones, also. There are a couple of variations in some states with adjacent census tracts, but that's generally the subset. Okay. All right, anything else? There, there were some, Bill, there's some answers for you in the chat. If you haven't looked there, you may want to take a look. Me, Michelle? Oh, Bill, Bill, Bill Dunkel. I just, just saw that. thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And it sounds like maybe we should have a future webinar on the state programs. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, thank you, Merrill and William, very much for joining us today. Thanks Happy to. Thank, thank you. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Merrill, it's, I guess last time we were in a meeting together was either cover dish dinner or youth group at Sinking Spring Presbyterian <laughs> in the 80s. So we'll have to do it more often. <laughs> That'd be great. I'll come to Vermont. <laughs>
Great. Excellent. <laughs>